Our guest on Perspectives today is Sarah Fowler Arthur, and she is the she represents District Seven on the State Board of Education and is state representative elect, and she's going to be replacing John Patterson, uh, who's reached his term limit. And Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you for having me today. First off, could you give us a little background on yourself, including why you decided to run for state representative? Sure, thank you. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to uh, reach out to mm. the constituents that you have listening in today. So mm. I have served on the State Board of Education for the past eight years and have really gotten involved in the education policy side of things. I enjoy that a lot. Um, and with Dr. Patterson being term limited, and I also was coming up on a term limit, I thought it presented a good opportunity to continue staying involved in the education policy side of things, as well as other areas of interest by running for the legislature. Additionally, uh, I'm a small business owner and grew up on a small farm, actually down in Rock Creek, and um, recently got married to my husband, Isaac Arthur, and we are living out in Geneva on the Lake. So uh, that's a very brief background, mm. but um, just a little bit. He's on the, is he still on the uh, board of ed educa or election board? Your husband? Yes. yes okay. He Obviously, he has to abstain from anything relating to myself, right. but um, that was something he also enjoyed doing and had participated in for a long time, and Topic of many conversations before getting married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a nice guy. I remember meeting him when I was covering the election board meetings. Right, and he also has a uh, YouTube channel, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, which has uh, grown exponentially in the past few years, and especially this year. It's been very interesting to uh, get my feet wet and start helping with the production side of that a little bit. And uh, that's that's added to my repertoire of interest. Well, you know, I know you're you're a graphic artist as well, and you started your first business at like eleven. Yes, I started selling eggs uh, to home delivery customers at eleven years old. And my grandparents had had chickens, and I really wanted to have some, and they encouraged me in my interest, and that grew to uh, producing several hundred dozen eggs a week with home delivery customers. Um, I was selling for a while to restaurants out in Cleveland. Wow. And, uh, a number of other uh, local grocery stores, Orlando's there in North Kingsville, had been a customer for a long time. And I did um, move out of that business after 13 years uh, when I, well, the same year that I ran for election to the State Board of Education, so in 2012. But it was definitely a great opportunity to get my feet wet, learn about management, handling money, making decisions, and I think that that experience has helped me on the State Board of Education as well as uh, will prove to be a valuable resource going into this legislative position. Sure. Um, one thing I wanted, I, we had Representative Patterson on last week, and he talked about something he's been working on pretty much since he was on the legislature, and that is um, a bill to undo the inequities in the school, uh, the state school systems. So many school systems have a lot more money than others do, and he says this is, this measure is a blueprint on what needs to be done but it's going to be up to the next legislature to uh, fund the measure. So are you familiar with his legislation, and, and what do you think of the whole thing? Yes, I am somewhat familiar with House Bill 305, and I've heard a lot of commentary from both sides. In fact, he and uh, Speaker Cup came and presented to the State Board of Education on the mm. draft version of the bill in January of 2019, um, they have ruled out a new version since then with m many more tweaks. And I think that the big question is still, how are we going to fund it? Because right. um, their, their new formula looks at how each individual um, cost 
for the district, but it doesn't necessarily take into consideration where that money is going to come from in the state budget. And I have talked to several folks in the education um, realm of the legislature, and I think that that's probably the biggest outstanding question because um, we don't want to give false hope by passing a bill that we can't pay for. And so I think that that's probably going to be the ongoing uh, conversation going forward is, um, you know, this, this is an interesting idea. How do we make sure that it fits the overall budget of the state and the district? Yeah, the, the genesis for all this was a, a ruling by the courts in the 90s that that education is being funded inequitably in Ohio school districts, and it's still a problem, though. It's still something that uh, is trying to be solved. It's an interesting thing, because the Ohio Supreme Court did rule in four different occasions that the school funding system was inequitable. Um, Their solution was perhaps different than what many people realize. Their solution was basically that we needed to look at how to make sure that um, it was being given an equal amount across the board. And I think since I served in six counties on the State Board of Education, one of the things that I didn't realize before that was, so if you are a district that is good at property taxes or income taxes, you might actually be asked to pay for more than a district that is not regardless of the wealth of your district. And so it, it may further disincentivize some of the local shares uh, in the way that the Supreme Court decisions were written. However, um, Bob Cup had served as a speaker, um, who is the speaker right now, had also served as a justice on the Supreme Court. And when they testified to the board last year, that question came up and he pointed out that the current law has not had a ruling for uh, constitutionality. So the way that it works is that a piece of legislation is passed and it changes the law, and there has to be a new ruling to determine whether or not that is constitutional or not, and the current law hasn't had that. Okay. So I think, I think that that is a, a, a part of the conversation that sometimes gets left out, that... Um, there, the, the way that we fund things is very complicated. I would welcome something that made it less complex and more <laughs> understandable, but I think many people would, but we also want to make sure that in the process we don't lose accountability, especially to the local district, because if we are losing accountability at the local level, it's most likely going to be in favor of more state control. And I have... Uh, seen in my time on the board that we have a lot of unfunded state mandates that cost districts money and that take time away from doing what teachers do best, which is teaching, and we don't necessarily see the returns we're hoping for in the name of accountability because it's not being directed at the local level. So I think that's a, a consideration that should not be forgotten. I was going to ask you about that, the, the importance of local control of the school districts. And sometimes you got to wonder when the state has these decisions that school districts have to do this or that, and they don't give them the money to pay for it, if it's just something for a legislator to put on his uh, re-election campaign or something <laughs> without, you know, it's easy to say you got to do this, and the school districts are already underfunded. A really good point, and a couple of critical examples that come to mind. The teacher and principal evaluation system, that was something that was originally implemented to meet some requirements in federal law that changed, and so we now have more flexibility than we previously did, but it changed the state law to say that instead of teachers being evaluated at the local level by the local school board, the principal, the superintendent, and ultimately the parents that have hired them to care for the education needs of their students, 
we're going to evaluate them at the state level and determine arbitrarily whether or not they're a good teacher. I think over the past 10 years, that's been demonstrated to not really effectually um, demonstrate whether or not a teacher is a good teacher, and yet we are still locked into that system where the state is determining through abstract criteria what makes a good teacher or through a test. And I have talked to so many teachers that feel that that really um, disenfranchises them from doing the work that they love. And that's just a small example. Another one would be the report cards uh, at the state level where we spend a lot of money testing students and can't be useful, but we are testing them, uh, spending a lot of time testing them, and ultimately rolling up into a number that has an impact on the funds that districts get and their perception in the community, but we haven't seen whether or not that actually makes a difference in the quality of education that the child's receiving. And I think that perhaps this year, with all of the frustrations of COVID-19, it may allow us to peel back some of those layers and look at which things are actually important to the education of our students and making sure that they are receiving the instruction and the attention from the teachers that we want them to have rather than an emphasis on additional tests, rather than an emphasis on checking boxes purely for paperwork purposes. You hear these things about, like, kids don't know anything about the Civil War because it's not on any of the state tests and there isn't any time to do anything but what's on the state test. So kids don't learn a lot of stuff because of that. We've gotten some public testimony to that effect even this year, not necessarily on the Civil War, but perhaps on aspects of um, American heroes or... uh, Harriet Tubman or other uh, important personalities of the past that we want to know about and teachers feel that they don't have time to delve in as deeply as they would like into exploring those histories with their students. But um, I would say Ohio is also unique because we have a founding documents law that requires instruction in our constitution of the federal government, the state government, the Northwest Ordinance, and we probably do actually um, instruct students more in some of those areas than in the past, but that doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement. Right, right. We've only got about a a minute and a half left, and I wanted to ask you about uh, Larry Householder. Uh, He is... Mm -hmm. He has been charged in one of the biggest bribery schemes in the state history, and when he is sworn in in January, there's talk about um, kicking him out of the legislature. What was your opinion about that? Uh, I really haven't heard a discussion on that point yet. I know that he was reelected in his own district, and the concern I heard earlier this year from legislative members was, do you override the voice of of his own constituents in removing him from office? But personally, I think a lot of it will come down to whether or not he's convicted of a charge, because we obviously have uh, an interest in making sure that justice is served to all of Ohio, but we also have a judicial system that protects the rights of everyone until they're proven guilty. So uh, personally, I think that it may come down to uh, what the what the outcome of that court ruling is. One thing is that he did not have an, anybody else running against him on the ballot. There were a few writing candidates, but he was the only one on the ballot. So. Mm-hmm. Um, That's an important consideration as well, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be very important for everyone that we make sure that justice is done right. both to him and to the, the constituents we, in the, okay. the state of Ohio. We are out of time. Sarah Fowler Arthur, thank you very much. We will have you on again. Thank you for your time. Um, on Perspectives, my, I'm Bob Lebzelder.